Brandon, what's up, man? Great to connect with you. I've been following you for a long time. I appreciate it, Ryan, man. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> yeah, you bet. Tell, tell me about that shirt. I didn't say anything before we hit record because I wanted to ask you about that shirt once we were recording. So talk to me about that shirt you're wearing right now. Well, it's, yeah, I don't know if it, it appears backwards, but it says Christ privilege. Um, and, and pretty much what I do is I make these definition shirts that people can wear around and it kind of, you know, jogs people's uh, understanding of, of certain topics. But this Christ privilege, you know, I don't believe in white privilege. I believe in Christ privilege. If you're a person that believe in God, then there is no door that a man can close um, that God is open for you. I, you know, I can really appreciate that. Uh, I know I've got obviously a different perspective which is interesting. It's almost, it, it, it almost makes me cringe to say it, but I know I've got a different perspective simply because of the color of my skin. Make, like I said, it makes me cringe to say it a little bit because it comes across <laughs> weird like that. But I think it's important we actually address these conversations, especially when it comes to terms that are being tossed around like white privilege. Right. I agree. What do you, uh, what do you think about that? Um, well, I know there's a lot of people who talk about it and say that uh, just because of the color of my skin that uh, I may have some advantages that maybe someone like yourself doesn't. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it's disingenuous. It's a disingenuous statement. You know, uh, do people who have white skin have a level of privilege? Yeah, I mean, it, there's, there's a, there's privilege to go around for everything you can imagine. You know, sometimes white people have privilege. Sometimes black people have privilege over white people, depending on the circumstances. If you are good looking, you have a privilege. If you're a beautiful woman, you have a privilege. If you got money in the bank and you got great credit, you got privilege. I mean, you can pick any, you know, segment of society or characteristic. Uh, characterization of a person or characteristics of a person and you can find a level of privilege that they may have over another person so i mean just be just living in america you, you have more privilege than mostly anybody in the world even even the, the poor amongst us are considered to be wealthy in a lot of other countries so um i think that to use and isolate the word white privilege is is used to uh, divide us used to um, create division that does not need to be there yeah, I think that's a really good point. It is disingenuous and it's applied so broadly that uh, it doesn't take into consideration other little nuances or the fact that somebody else might have a privilege, so to speak, because they are better looking than somebody else like you had suggested. I, you know, I actually feel the same way when it comes to the term toxic masculinity. You know, I, I know, for example, that some men use, for example, uh, physical strength to harm other people, uh, but to apply this broad term of toxic masculinity and then to uh, attempt to lump everybody in this category without considering the uh, exceptions or the nuance to the term is a very dangerous proposition. Well, yeah, if you, especially when you try to lump character resist, uh, you know, I say keep saying characteristics, characteristics. But it, when you start to lump in a person's traits or actions to something that's considered to be toxic, and that's that's based on another person's opinion. Um, we have, you know, been ever since the Bible days, you know, we men have been going to war and conquering and, and developing and all of these different things. So to me, violence and war is not toxic. It, it is necessary in certain situations in order for us to either remain safe or create a situation like we've done in America where we have a, a free society where we can openly worship. And, and it's probably the, the, the biggest melting pot in the world. So there is, you know, there's a time and a place for violence. Some people think it's toxic. I think it's it's appropriate uh, within the, the confines of society that we live in. So I don't, I don't really buy into that toxic masculinity stuff. And I, like, I, like, again, I think people use wording like Black Lives Matter, Planned Parenthood. And, and, you know, they use words, toxic masculinity. They use certain words to trigger a certain emotion in a person. And the, the, the creation of that word or the idea behind it, in my opinion, is disingenuous. They, they're people just creating things because they either hate certain people or a certain group of people, they want to hold them down. Um, and then when you hear somebody talk about things like toxic, toxic masculinity, they don't have any relevant points. You know, it's, it's not like they actually are pointing out um, things that are that are problematic in society on an on a epidemic level. They're talking about the fact that they don't like that men open a door for women or they don't like that men right. have more, you know, they're stronger than women or maybe, you know, consider themselves to be more dominant in certain areas than women are. They, they somehow want men to be emasculated. So. You know, I, I, I really don't appreciate terms like that because I think they come from a bad spot. Or, you know, the other thing I've seen is they'll take an isolated uh, example. Let's say a woman uh, is in a relationship, for example, that is abusive, physically abusive, as an example. 
And then they'll apply that broadly. They'll say, see, masculinity is toxic. No, that, right. that individual's behavior was toxic. Certainly, I think the overwhelming majority of us would agree with that. But I don't think that applies broadly to all men, you, me, anybody else who might be listening to this podcast. Yeah, I mean, people could argue that femininity is is uh, toxic. You know what I'm saying? You know, sure. You have sure. you have this culture of this uh, accusations of of rape and and different things that are done maliciously um, to target people, and that's only applied. Women can only do that. Men men don't get away with saying that a woman raped them and and somehow they get some sympathy, whether true or not. Um, but I think that women women have that ability. You know, uh, women control a, a lot of the you know men and sexuality. I mean, I mean, just be honest, uh, sex sales and, and men are dumb enough to buy it. So uh, women have a level of control there, at least in our society, they have a level of control on, on purchasing power by using their body to, to an advantage. I think that's toxic. I think some of, you know, but that doesn't describe every woman. My wife is not out there doing that, you know, sure. and that's why I married her. You know, I wouldn't marry a woman that's out there selling a, her soul to make some money for somebody else or herself. So people, you know, it's a person, it's a personal opinion, you know, what's toxic, what's not toxic. That's my opinion. Some people make a fortune off of doing that and, and they turn their life around and nobody ever knew they did it, you know? So it, it's, it's really terms that are created that, that try to be the norm or try to force that into society as a normative thought. I think is those things are problematic. Well, I'm glad you said the phrase you used is men and men are dumb enough to buy it. I'm actually really glad that you used that phrase because that puts a level of responsibility on our shoulders. So you'll hear about guys who complain about all these, these women on Instagram showing off their bodies and, and, and revealing too much and, and they'll complain about her and say, oh, this is not healthy. And yet you're the one following them. You're the one subscribed. You're the one buying their stuff. You're the one promoting them. That's why they do that. If the, if the intention wasn't there, they wouldn't be so so apt to, to do these things that you say you disapprove of. Right. It's a demand. It's a demand yeah, there. For sure. You know, they Absolutely. got this thing called only only fans, uh, only friends or whatever it's called. But I think women, I don't know what I, people may do other stuff on there, but what it's known for and from what I know is that people, I guess, sell sex on there. They, they show the body parts and do stuff for money and whatever. And you know, women wouldn't be and it's mostly women, I'm assuming. Uh, maybe men do it too, but oh, I'm um, sure it is. You, women wouldn't be able to do it in the, in, in the proportionality that they do it if there wasn't a demand. Pornography right. in America is the same thing. You know, uh, sex trafficking in America is the same thing. It wouldn't be prolific if there wasn't a demand. And most of pornography and things like that are associated with the demand coming from males, coming from men that are desiring to watch it, to consume it, to pay, I don't know, pay money for this stuff, strip clubs, all of these things, there is a demand. And so therefore um, people be, end up being to the supply or there are other males that, you know, put women in these positions so that they can make money off of them. And, you know, somebody who's desperate or somebody who didn't grow up with a dad or who's lost or who has, you know, emotional damage may go into these fields and get manipulated. But the onus is on the demand side. You know, if men want to stop seeing women do certain things, then they need to stop um, demanding um, that that's something that's appropriate. That's right. So definitely, I agree that there is a demand, but there's also a normalization of it in society, right? That it's uh, that, that women flaunting their body, for example, is some sort of sexual revolution or that pedophilia is another example, uh, is, is somehow a sexual preference. And so there's this normalization of the sexualization of women. Uh, and, and then it becomes, uh, I think, taboo initially. And then, okay, I'm curious about this. And so we explore it. And then ultimately it becomes accepted and even embraced as a, as a culture and society, which I think is really destructive. I agree. And, and just like homosexuality, you know, I think that, you know, it doesn't mean that a person is evil or a bad person if they, if they fall into um, the, the, homosexual lifestyle. But if we want to be honest, if a human being is somehow attracted to the same sex, there's something that has gone that's misfired in the brain because that's not the evolution of humanity. Yeah, that's not the natural uh, affections of a person. That's not natural because natural affections of a person is that you are to uh, reproduce after your own likeness. And, and the same thing with animals. If you, you know, saw a male lion in a, in a, in a, you know, a cage or something or at the zoo and the male lion try to jump on the back of another male lion, you know, you would be like, what, what's wrong with that animal? What, what, like what's wrong with him? And I'm not comparing humans to animals, but what I'm saying is that we have now normalized people who are in 
engulfed in a struggle. Um, some people are engulfed in struggle because of molestation, sexual perversion, exposure to sexuality, whether they um, have had um, a negative experiences with the opposite sex. Some people are going through a tremendous struggle in that area. And instead of addressing it, instead of, you know, taking away the normalization of it, people are thrusting and celebrating people into a, a really dark place where many people probably want to get out, but they can't because they have been, you know, thrusted into it. They've been told that hey, you're born this way. It's normal for you to feel this way. Mm -hmm. And then on the back end of it, we see high rates of suicide and depression and stuff amongst people who are in that lifestyle. And it's not because other people put pressure on them. It's because the own internal battle of waking up one day and saying, man, I'll never have a family because I can't reproduce in, in, the, in the type of sexual environment that I'm in. And so I, I think that, you know, that the normalization of a lot of things, transgenderism, you know, somebody that is somehow a physically a man, but they don't see themselves as a man. That something has gone on in their mind. And I wish that we would take the time to offer up a solution for them. You know, you know, we live in America. You don't have to do nothing that you don't want to do pretty much. But I wish that we would have available solutions for people who do find themselves in a in, considered to be a struggle and they want to find another pathway out of this this mental state that they've they've been in. Yeah, I, I actually just wish we could have a conversation about it because it seems to me increasingly that uh, doctors are coerced and manipulated even at the risk of losing their licenses to uh, actually affirm somebody's real sex and gender. They have to now affirm in many states by law, affirm uh, somebody's uh, gender dysphoria and they can no longer even have the conversation, a therapist, for example, about why do you feel like as a young boy or a man that you are a girl or a woman, you can't even have those conversations anymore by law or at the risk of losing your, your medical license. It's a very slippery slope to go down. You know, if my son came to me and said, daddy, I think I'm a girl. I mean, I'm not going to slap him across the head and scream at him and tell him, go lift some weights. I'm going to talk to him about it because there is a reason why he feel this way. That does not necessarily mean that the reasoning that he's initially feeling is the reasoning that he will, once he have a conversation about it and the curiosity can be explained. If someone will sit down and talk to him and say, you know, why, why do you feel like you're a girl or whatever the case may be? Cause you want to be a cheerleader just because you want to cheer. It don't mean that you're a girl That's um, right. just because you may not be attracted to women right now. Don't necessarily make you gay. You know, uh, you, you know, you may be, you know, I tell people all the time, you know, there's decisions in life that you make, and you don't always have to fall for your initial lust or what you what you feel at the time. You can always say no to things, it's just, you know, and I, I would tell my child is to have the conversation with him and say, look, you, you may be attracted to men. That doesn't mean that you have to date men. It doesn't mean you have to live a lifestyle like that. You, you may not have to. That's the same thing with a married man. Like you may see a woman that look real good, but that don't mean you got to go for it. That don't mean you're going to leave your wife for her, even though you may be more attracted to her. So there are desires that we have that we don't always have to, you know, succumb to. So and I think those conversations need to be had instead of affirming just some of these things are just completely ridiculous, like pronouns. Like, I mean, yeah. it's defying the English language in order right. to suffice a, a slippery slope of, uh, um, I mean, it's a never ending cycle of confusion. You know, he, hers and them and they, them and they, and I'm, I'm binary, but I'm her. It's like, it's like, when are you you're just going to go down a slippery slope of confusion and you, you're not going to have identity. You're not going to know who you are. You don't even know what to expect from yourself. So um, th those things are important for us to slow down, not, not beat people over the head, but have these you know genuine conversations with them. Uh, you know, I'm really glad you brought up the concept of language because I think it is being deliberately misinterpreted and redefined in order to push forward an agenda because you take men and women, for example, if man means nothing, or I should say it this way, if man means everything, it actually means nothing and vice versa for the term woman. And so, uh, you know, somebody, uh, a man, for example, who believes himself to be a woman, well, if, if woman means nothing, then do you really believe yourself to be a woman or you see what I'm saying? So it's a, yeah. it's a very interesting thing. And you talked about black lives matter and you talk about, uh, these words and these phrases that we use that are, uh, I think Ben Shapiro talks about it as being semantically overloaded. Uh, so it's hard to interpret or decipher the actual intent of the organization or movement or message that's being shared because we're using words that, you know, sound right. Black lives matter. Yeah. 
Of course. I think everybody would pretty much, agree. There, there's probably a, a, a very small percentage of the population who would not agree with that statement in and of itself. But generally, I think most people would say, yeah, that's, that's true. Black lives do matter. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, unless you're a, a white supremacist clan member um, or you're a black person that live in the inner city and you gangbang all day and, you, and you've been responsible for killing and destroying your own black community, maybe you don't think black lives matter. But in a general sense, most black people or most people in America do agree with the sentiment. However, the organization has nothing to do with the mattering of black lives, just like Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood is not planning a parenthood. It's actually planning to destroy a parenthood. I mean, that's mo majority of why people go to Planned Parenthood is to terminate a pregnancy. I mean, just, just let's be honest. They're not doing full service. How do I know? How do you know, Mr. Tatum? Because I was there. You know, my, my son's mom tried to have an abortion and I was in the lobby mm -hmm. praying that she didn't do it. And, 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 the, they didn't give us any services after she made the decision not to have an abortion. They didn't give us any. So we didn't even, we never went there again. You know, we went to an actual place where they gave us services and, and different things of that nature, but they do use linguistics. They use words to trick your emotions and they have another plot in an agenda. That's the same way they use with pronouns. You know, the same people that are saying, you need to acknowledge my pronouns. I'm them and they, and I'm non-binary. But these are the same people that are pushing for the gender wage gap to be resolved. Well, well, if there's no gender, if gender is a construct of the mind, then what are you talking about that there's a gender wage gap between male and female? I thought mm. that, what about non-binary? Where, where does their wage gap? It goes into a slippery slope of people, really insecure individuals, looking for a way to divide or, or to isolate themselves and make their victimhood a little more prominent. But I think in our society, for the people who are aware, we need to really watch out for these words because they may not necessarily represent what the efforts are uh, being pushed forward. Do you think people are using this uh, linguistic little game they're playing here as, as a medium to push forward an agenda uh, or are they ignorant to the fact of, of, of how things really work? Like, wh what is the ultimate purpose of using these words to confuse and manipulate and gray out some of these areas that seem to me to be pretty black and white? Yeah, I think the, the founders of these organizations, the leaders of the organizations, they, they have a, 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 a totally different plot than what they're presenting to the public. And then people are ignorant and they fall in the cycle of it. You know, uh, Margaret Sanger, the, the founder of Planned Parenthood, was a eugenicist. She hated black people and she she wanted to use population control. And mm. now now how, how do you people, know that? Is that something that she's that she said that it's been yeah, documented it's, that she's OK? It's on it's, it's on record of her making statements against black babies and, and, and literally saying, why would you bring a baby in the world that is pretty much to have a, have the perfect life? And that's not the way you should think about life. You know, you can't say just because I'm poor don't mean I can't have children. I can't love children. I cannot raise children or because I don't have an optimum situation. Margaret Sanger on record um, and it, it's, it's played in the movie Uncle Tom that I'm in. It's a documentary. But we have a clip of her just saying it straight out that why would you bring it's evil to bring a child in the world if you are at a certain level of poverty or whatever the case may be, which I don't think is, is reasonable, but that's, she's not God and she's not the one to judge that. However, that, that is the, the reasoning behind a lot of her practices. And it was also said that she was racist against black people. And that was her reference point was poor black people in that situation. So, you know, you have Planned Parenthood founders who have a, an agenda, but the people that go there are like, oh, I just want to, you know, save my career. It's my body, my choice. And they, they don't even know the, the initial purpose of it. Black Lives Matter, a Marxist organization. The founders of Black Lives Matter. Self-proclaimed Marxist organization. Self-proclaimed. It's not even, it's not speculative. It's They self-proclaim Marxists. And you look at their website, they want to destroy the nuclear family. I mean, these are all principles of, uh, of communism and Marxism and things that are destroying the country. Yet, they try to disguise it as black lives. Yet, they only care about black lives that can make them money that get killed by a white police officer. Because in the inner city where people are dying just this weekend, 100 shootings in Chicago, they 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 won't even 
post condolences. Children are dying. I mean, it, it, we, it's over, I think it's over a hundred kids. Not, I mean, I said, I think it was 30 the last time I did a video about it. It was over 30 kids. It's probably 50 kids at this point that have been murdered in inner city violence. I mean, kids, I'm talking about month olds, it's my right. five year olds, six year olds. Um, we, we've helped out on my channel. We've, we've supported at least two children that have, that have died. Sakaria so Turner was one. We donated $300,000 to her family, but you know, she was a little girl. I think she was like six years old and she got murdered and black lives matter. Wouldn't even post a picture of her. They won't even acknowledge it. So when you look at it, the Marxist, you know, ideology that is stimulating all of these things. And when you see them in action, you say, okay, I know exactly what they're doing. And, and, and I think the same thing is for the Democrat party. It's like, they don't care about people coming over our border. They don't care about, you know, um, people coming from the southern border needing opportunities. They could care less because if they care, they would really uh, put an end to this illegal migration. Because what happens? They bring children over here unaccompanied. Um, the coyotes are taking them over here. They're getting paid by the cartel. They rape these kids on the way over here. They rape women on the way over here. I mean, it's, it's not a secret. They're sex trafficking kids over here. It is a money making industry. Of, of the cartel and, and, and Mexican officials that are, I mean, not Mexican officials, but Mexican police that are involved in this. They are funneling these kids over and making lots of money. And we know it. Our government knows it. We catch the people who are, fun, who are trafficking these children, but we don't want to do anything about it is because the Democrats, by and large, in my opinion, they want a persona of we care about you. Come, come be a new voting block for us. We'll give you mm. amnesty. We don't care how you get here. We don't care, you know, you're getting people lying dead in the middle of the desert trying to get to get to Arizona and stuff in, in the heat of the summer. They don't care about you. And you know, and they just need they just need the votes. They just need the power. And and based on what but I've how seen, do you know how, how do you know and where does that where does that conclusion come from? Because I you know, I I know that there's a lot of people who actually do care about those individuals. I, I'm one of them, you know. I I, I feel for a father who has children, for example, or a wife who uh, is in a less than uh, great environment and and chooses to look at the American way of life and the American dream and the opportunities that we have here. And if I was a father, I'd be doing the same thing. And so I look at that with a level of empathy. I agree that we need to do this legally and we need to make sure that it's all regulated. But But what makes you come to the conclusion that it's a devious intent versus an honorable and noble intent? Because you can see the flip flop in policy. You can see the flip flop in language. You know, when, you know, uh, I think it was when Hillary Clinton was running against Trump or before that election, when, Ob when Obama was in office, Obama said it out his mouth. Do not come here. It's not safe. Uh, the Democrats were saying, do not come here. They were blaming Republicans of using cheap labor and manipulating these people that would come over here. They pay them under the table. So Democrats had a certain perspective and they were blaming Republicans for it. And now the Democrats are saying, please come, please come over here. And our ICE officials and people are, are, are arresting sex traffickers all day long. And think about it like this. We have had a Congress for I don't know how many years whether they are Democrat, Republican, both sides are responsible for this to a certain degree. Why haven't sure. they fixed our immigration policies? They are being prejudiced towards certain people that do need help. Because what about people in Africa? They, they don't they can't just get on a boat and cruise over here. They're letting people flood in from South America. And think about this. We were just in the, in the covid crisis, but they let people come in a country that's not even vetted. They're not even, they're not taking vaccines. They, we don't know if they have COVID or not. They don't care. They letting a whole swath of people flood our Southern border with no kind of protection for the American citizens. Then you talk about social distancing and wearing masks. They put them in a facility where they're not social distancing. They're laying on top of each other and right. during a epidemic and during a pandemic. So when you look at it, you say, why haven't y'all fixed the policies? You know, legally coming over into our country, you can accept more people into our country. You can make it easier to file uh, for asylum. And, and, you know, you don't have to separate families at the border if they come seeking asylum um, at, a, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a point of entry. So, you know, all of these things as a, as a, as a citizen uh, observant person, you can see that this is what they're doing. They create these places called sanctuary cities and sanctuary states. And it's like, well, no, there, there's people, MS-13, like, are, are we not talking about MS-13? Are we not addressing the fact that these kids are coming over here and these people, these males and these adults with them are not even their parents? They don't even know where their parents are at. So once they get over here and they're out in America, who, who's going to take care of them? We don't, we, we can't even take care of our own kids. 
in America, American citizens, you know, so when you look at the totality of the circumstance, you say, man, this is a very disingenuous approach. And if any one side wanted to do something about it, they could actually do something about it. How about we go into their country and give them better opportunities? They don't have to come to America if we can mm. help them and build something for them in their own country. Um, but we are not. Do you think that's, uh, do you think that's uh, prudent or wise to go into other countries, for example, and, and offer help and assistance? I mean, I, I was in the military and I saw, uh, situations where we would, you know, exert our our ideals uh, regarding democracy and other environments, and it didn't seem like it went all that well because we don't fully understand different cultures and history and the animosity and contention. And it seems to me that it creates sometimes in in cases uh, a greater problem than had we just left things alone. Like, where is our obligation in the world scene, and where does it end? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I I'm I may sound like a conspiracy theorist, but I never a lot of times I don't think our government have good intent to start with. You know, they send you over there to do, you know, uh work in the community and try to help out the people. They're not they're there to conquer. They're there to push and get people elected that our government want to be elected, you know, and that's why I, a lot of countries hate us because we down there interfering in their elections, you know, with, with the, under the guise of right. we're helping people out right. and building tents for people. And it's like, no, we want oil. That's why we came over here to be honest, weapons of mass destruction. We, they know they lied. It was no weapons of mass destruction. And, and so if we actually made an earnest attempt to do it, maybe we could be effective, but we, we're not in the business of helping people out unless it benefit us. I mean, I hate to say it, but our country has a reputation of doing that. And like I said, we we won't give efforts in some of these places where they may be seeking help. I mean, we've helped destroy a couple of places um, that will be economic booms. We have propped up uh, communist or socialist uh, dictators um, in Cuba and other places. You know, we, we've propped them up. Venezuela, we prop them up. Uh, some of our government officials are, are cheering on these guys. And then now people are starving and money means nothing in some of these countries. And what are we doing now? We just turn a blind eye, you know? So I think if we had an earnest attempt of doing that, we can be successful. However, we have to really understand this. And I think that if we apply this to our own family is that you can't save the world and you can't do good in the world if you can't even take care of your own home. And so Mm -hmm. what is the point of bringing in a million people a year when there's a billion people starving, you're not even making a dent in the, around the country. However, you're, you're, putting a strain on your own country and you have people in California that are sleeping in the road. They have MRSA, you know, homelessness is is out of control in many major cities. Poverty is, is, you know, something to be, to be concerned about education. We're the dumbest, one of the dumbest countries on planet earth. So it's like, we really need to focus on our own house. Like I do with my child. I focus on my own kids. I can help other people, but I have to be stable here. And then I can reach out to help people. I don't just let people come in my house, uh, you know, unvetted, you know, and and, sure, and if, I, if I can't deal with this, I'm not going to be successful um, out dealing with other people's issues. You know, Brandon, I think one of the biggest challenges with what you're saying here is that, uh, again, the, the overwhelming majority of people, I think, would agree with you that we need to take care of our own. We need to make sure we're taken care of and established and set. And then we can help from there. And not only can we help, we'll be in a better position to help if our stuff is taken care of. It's hard, though, because people see it so differently. You know, take parenting, for example. The way that I raise my four kids is probably similar to the way that you raise your children, although there's probably some differences. Uh, You know, somebody across the street or somebody on the other side of the country is going to raise their kid differently because they're seeing it differently. We all agree, hey, we want to take care of ours and our own. And yet the way that we go about doing it, there might be some conflict there. And that contention, I think, is what ends up stalemating us in a lot of ways. Yeah. And, and yeah, you, you're right. I mean, I have to be open to say that people have a different perspective. You know, I, I'm more on the absolute truth side of it. You know, there's a, a reasonable way to raise your children and then there's a terrible way to raise your children. And that's why they grow up and be criminals and, and out here acting a fool and you can't control them. You know, if you give your kid everything, everything is free. They don't have to work for anything. No accountability, no responsibility. Oh, they're just kids. They just do whatever they want to do. And they become right. that adult. And I think that, you know, that that goes back to the way our country operates, too, when it comes to law enforcement. You know, some people want to defund the police and create uh, public programs. And it's like, no, there needs to be law enforcement, because if you just let people run rampant, what do you know? Crime rate is up 800 percent in Portland, 100 percent. And it's like it's like not disciplining your children and then expecting them to somehow figure it out on their own. There, There needs to be a level of discipline. There is a right and wrong way 
within reason, you know, like, like I said, you and I may be similar in parenting. We may have some differences, but we're not way over here in left field, you know, uh, uh, parenting our kids, um, you know, like they're, like they're animals, you know what I'm saying? So, right. I think to a certain degree, there's relatively a right and a wrong way to do a lot of these things. Yeah, I agree with that. And, you know, since we were talking about privilege earlier, there's also another privilege that often gets overlooked and that's fatherhood privilege. You know, that, that the fact that a young woman or a young man could grow up without, or excuse me, with a father in his life is a huge privilege that I realize not every child gets, unfortunately. Yeah. And, 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 you know, at the end of the day, people have to look in the mirror, you know, and, and say, what am I going to do about it? Either you be the, the father that needs to be in their child's life, look in the mirror and suck it up and make sure you're there despite the drama and chaos. Or if you're a child and you grew up without a father, you make the best of it. Don't let that be a crutch and an excuse. However, when you look at the grand scheme of things, it should be incredibly important for people to make positive decisions when having children. Because a lot of times people look at the father and say, oh man, the father's a deadbeat. Well, the mama was sleeping with the father who was a deadbeat. She right. put them in that situation as well. Or, you know, mom left dad or whatever and broke up with him or, or mom has multiple kids by different men who, for whatever reason, they're not involved, wh whether they be bad guys or not. Or you have situation. I'm not just blaming women because men need to take responsibility. But, you know, you have a woman who have a child and she feels entitled and the man has no rights and she creates drama for the man. And, and, and it's hard for him to see his child. They play games and drama. And, and eventually a man says, look, I'm moving on to start my own family and I can't deal with the drama anymore from this mm -hmm. particular person. Therefore, father's not involved. And this particular woman would celebrate and say, look, I'm this proud single mom and I did it all by myself but they don't even acknowledge how the kid feel about it. You know, they, they pat themselves on the back, but the kid is struggling, wondering where my daddy's at. So, but I think in a culture where we accept this, the, this, this notion of, you know, fornicating and having children out of wedlock and it's just totally normal. I mean, we, we put women in the position to be empowered to do these things. Therefore, vicariously, we're allowing men to get off the hook, especially with abortions and all these other programs that we have. It's like- That's a good point. We, we, men, men, like if you were an irresponsible man and you had, you, you know, you, I call it play video games. You playing video games with a woman, y'all have a kid, you know, and you're not responsible and you're a deadbeat. You, you could just walk away. Why? Because her options are government assistance, do it by herself or have an abortion. You don't have no responsibility. But if there, those weren't options, a lot of men will be forced to step up. And I think a lot of women will make better decisions about the dudes that they're with. You know, I almost have no I feel sorry for no woman that wasn't married. If that man didn't love you enough to marry you, you shouldn't be sleeping with him. And so I have no sympathy and I have no sympathy for men who weren't married and even including myself. I wasn't married when I had my first son and I've been through hell uh, for 11 years now. So, uh, but I don't blame nobody but myself. But anyway, I, that's, a, that's another story. But fathers being involved is incredibly important and, and I wish our society would push that more. You know, it's funny because you say, I don't have any sympathy, but I, I would actually contend with that a little bit because the message that you share and the things I've heard you talk about, even in the past several minutes, uh, maybe it's not sympathy, but you are trying to spread a message of truth and one that's empowering to other people. Uh, I think we've, as, as, as a society and, and, and just generally, not everybody, but generally uh, equated uh, making people feel good about their, their, temporary decisions or their desires is somehow an indicator of our love. But I would suggest that if you're willing to have difficult conversations, if you're willing to challenge uh, unhealthy assertions and assumptions, that that's a greater indicator of I care about you than let me affirm all the bad choices you're making. Right, right. I, th I think that, you know, maybe me saying that uh, I don't have any sympathy is, is probably not explained in its totality. I don't have any sympathy for a person playing the victim if mm. they're in that situation. I have sympathy for the person in general because people make mistakes. You know, you're young, you mess sure, up. Right. Thing. But if a person want to say, oh, look, poor me, you know, how, I'm, I'm a single mom. And it's like, well, you know, don't make excuses for it. You know, you need to be aware that you had 100 percent responsibility in making a decision to be with a man that he, that was not committed to you or that he was a nut before you met him. You know what I mean? Like, like one day he woke up and he was a bad person. He was bad to you when y'all were, uh, you know, up in the bedroom. So 
when I say sympathy, it means I don't have sympathy for person, a person playing a victim. I do have sympathy for a person who made a mistake and they want to get on the right path and they need some words of encouragement. You fight through it until you make it make it better. Same thing I would say for young men that was in the position that I was in. You keep fighting. 11 years later, I keep fighting. I keep fighting. I'm going to make the best of the situation um, and then we'll be OK. But if a young man come and cry to me and say, man, it's messed up. What's happening to me? What, 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 were you married? Well, no, I wouldn't. Wait, 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 wait. Well, you, why you, why you, why you sleeping with a person you're not married to, you're not committed to? This is what happens to you. So don't, don't cry to me. I'm not gonna feel sorry for you, but I will say, let's, let's pick up your boots, put your, pull your bootstraps up, and let's go, and let's make it better. Do the best that you can, but it ain't. It's no time for a pity party. Yeah, I appreciate that perspective, and I think the world needs more of that. Frankly, especially that, that that's what I would call fathering. It isn't always nice. It isn't always comfortable, but it's real. It's genuine. It can be in your face and it can be uncomfortable, but it comes from the right place. And that's what it sounds like it is for you. Don't, don't complain to me. Let me tell, teach you how not to be a victim. Let me teach you how to make better choices. That to me is a better indicator of care. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, that's how my dad treated me. Is that, uh, is that part of the reason that you became a police officer or tell me a little bit about your story uh, coming off your, 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 uh, career as an athlete and then moving into, uh, law enforcement. Yeah. Um, I mean, law enforcement was just rant. It was random. You know, for me, it was random. Maybe God had a plan in the first place, but for me, it was random. Um, you know, I, I was an athlete my whole life. You know, I was an all American football player at a high school, a top player in the nation. I had scholarship to every university that I, that I wanted to go to except Texas. University of Texas. I was, my brother was a Longhorn. So I, is that I where really you want, that's where you wanted to go? That's where I wanted to go. And they were the only team. I mean, I was an all American. I was the number one safety. Some say I was number one, number two in the nation. And Texas didn't offer any defensive backs in my class. They offered like <laughs> six of them in my brother's year. He was an all American the year before me. Is that and right? so, uh, you know, I was devastated. Like Texas, you know, how do you put me Come on down. Running back or something? Y'all could do something. <laughs> I've been a Longhorn fan since I was in the seventh grade. I used to go to the camps every year. Y'all, how dare you? <laughs> But then I, I decided to go and play for the University of Arizona because Coach Stoops was there. Half of the roster was from Texas. I know a lot of people there. So I played there, and, and football just didn't turn out the way I wanted to. And I was a tremendous athlete. You know, I ran a 4-3 and a 40. I had a 44-inch vertical leap. You know, I could do the bench 32 Dang. times. Like, I was a freak athlete. There was no athlete, as far as numbers, that was even close to me in college. And I did that as a freshman. I was a mm. freshman in college. And so as an incredible athlete, I thought I was going to the NFL. My character wasn't good enough. The coaches and I didn't vibe. We were on a we were a losing team, you know. So all of the the, the, the factors were in place, and I was at a very low point, And I got saved in 2008. I went to church. I got baptized in Jesus' name, filled with God's Spirit, and that just revolutionized my life. It really did. I stopped cursing. I stopped listening to rap music. I just had a different perspective on life, on race, on. I mean, God just opened me up to a lot of things. So fast forward, I was in the 2010 NFL draft. So I went to college in 05. In 2010, I was in the NFL draft, had a draft party. My agent said I was going to get drafted by the Oakland Raiders. They passed on me in front of my whole family. We were all waiting uh, for me to get drafted, and they passed. Uh, and I was devastated, man. Tried out for another year, whole year of training, NFL lockout. The very next year, I was to try it with the coaches. NFL lockout happened. I couldn't even perform in front of the agents. Um, I, I think I, I still trained a little bit and, and uh, tried out for a semi-pro team, which I got an offer for. It was the Omaha Nighthawks at the time. They had offered me to come to minicamp. However, I had met a guy who was an incredibly successful businessman. He mentored me through the process. And this is the process when I had my son. He mentored me through the process and told me to put an X on the calendar for football. Like when it's not yielding results, man, you got to move in a different direction. And he mm -hmm. gave me this whole speech about how football players are rich. But I'm, he said of himself, I'm wealthy. Like, if you're if you're the top of the game, you may make a couple million dollars a year. I, I make millions of dollars a year for the rest of my life. And, you know, he's an incredible entrepreneur, you know, his own private jet and all these other things. And so I, it really stuck to me. And I said, you know, I need to make a decision. I apply for everything in the city of Tucson. Police department was one of them. And I never thought about being a cop. And eventually <laughs> they called me back. And it was like, you know, at first I was like, am I in trouble? And they're like, you, you apply for the job. And I'm like, oh, OK, all right. I mean, so I said, let me do a ride along because I have no idea what I'm talking. I have no idea right, about police. Right. So I did a ride along and it just blew me away. Officer Sean Payne, which he's in the book that I wrote um, about policing in America. And he, 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 he just blew me away. I couldn't believe that this man was doing this stuff every day. I mean, this is 
this is superhero stuff. You know, uh, I was on the ride along, only did half a shift, and we went from changing the old lady, yeah, elderly lady, I don't like to say an old lady, but an elderly <laughs> lady's tire to like saving a guy who was committing suicide. He was actively cutting his wrist when we showed up to the scene. Like, really? And, and Sean wasn't phased. He got back in the car and we were just talking, and I'm just like, dude, I'm, I'm like, my heart is still racing from us driving over here. Like, you, you, you didn't done all this and you back in the car acting like nothing happened. Like, bro, are you even human? And I'm like, and I'm so like shook that I'm like, it's no way he does this every day. That's no, just like no way. And so I asked him like, do you do this every day? Like, he said, I do this every day. Like, it's, I, I, dude, I was blown away. Like I had never seen a person that I, that I looked at and I said, dang, this dude is a real hero. Like these football players are cool. You know, it's some sacrifice and some hard work, but like, no doubt, right? they're not doing this. And, and and I said, you know, I want to be that guy. So I, I, I finished the application. I performed really well. I was at the top of the class and, you know, I became a police officer. You talked about your character being off when you were playing football in college. What do you mean by that specifically? Man, I grew up, I grew up in, in a, what I would consider a violent environment, man. You know, I, I had a violent attitude. Um, I actually got kicked out of high school. When, in my senior year, after I committed to the University of Arizona, I got kicked out of high school. Um, oh, wow. They, because I threw a chair at a teacher. And to be honest, I was going to fight her. If it would, if it would, and she was a woman, I was going to be, I was going to beat her up. If she wasn't, if it wasn't for my friend who was holding me back to play football with me, they ended up kicking me out of school. They brought me back after three or six weeks. I can't remember if we appealed it or not, but they, they, I was in alternative school and then they brought me back, which was good because I wanted to finish running track uh, because, you know, I, I was a, all-American football player. I couldn't be at an alternative school. And then, so they right, ended up bringing right. me back. And, 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 but, but man, my our attitude was still very violent, man. I used to listen to rap music. I grew up, you know, my cousin then was all gangster. You know, I got jumped in the gang when I was like 10, mm. you know, my cousin, we used to fight each other all the time, you know? And so I just, was, I just grew up around that, man. I just felt I was a very violent young man. Um, I had a good heart, but like, if you say the wrong thing to me, I get offended. I was emotional. And so when I got to college and the coaches were yelling at me, man, I was not taking it well. You know, like I went to fight them and stuff. I wasn't, you know, you know, you were in the military, you know, in the military, you go to boot camp. You can't take it personal. You know, it's just like right. they're yelling at you. They, yeah, it isn't personal. Game. Feels like they, it is. Yeah, yeah. It's a game. You know, they they may it may make you feel that way. You may feel like they they, they hate you and they want to kill you. But, you know, it's it's just a it's a thing that they're playing to develop you. But when I was you know, I, I didn't know nothing about this. When I got to college and they were cut, calling me names and stuff, I was, my mom was like, I'm going to fight these guys. Like, you know, what's, mm -hmm. you'll never talk, disrespect me like that. And so that wasn't a good fit. And that kind of led to my career not really uh, going in the direction I wanted to go in. Yeah. Do you think that uh, that that violent upbringing and, and personality w was drawn out by the people you're with? It sounds like your dad was around and it sounds like, I mean, you, you already alluded to some things that he had taught you that I think were healthy, but where did, where did that response to some of these things come from? Yeah, I can say, uh, my mom was pretty, pretty violent. You know, she was a very violent person. You know, she's a great person. She loved me and my brother to death and she'd do anything for us. And I hope she don't get offended, but she was, she was very violent, you know, like she fight people and you know, that's the way it was, you know, her and my stepmom got into a physical fight. You know, we were in middle school, uh, right in the front yard and, you know, cause my mama grew up around violence. You know, my, my mm -hmm. grandmother actually had my mama at 12 years old and at 12, 12, she got raped by my grandfather and, uh, you know, oh, my grandmother got goodness. raped by my grandfather and she had my mama at 12 years old. So she can't read. She still to this day, she can't read um, really? because back then when you, if you had a child, you couldn't go to school and then, and then on top of that, we were poor and my family was illiterate. So it's not like anybody taught her to read. So even today in 2021, she can't really read anything. So, and my grandfather's in my, my, I call him my grandfather because he was, he was with my grandmother since she was 16, but my original real grandfather passed away. Um, but my grandfather, I, he, Willie B, he, he's in the, he retired military. He got out cause he had PTSD. Um, and you know, he can read. So that's the only way she can survive is because he knows, he knows how to read, but you know, growing up around that and you know, my cousins, a couple of my family members doing life in prison, you know, I just, it wasn't my dad. It was, it was really like peers. And then it was rap music because that's, I just, you know, you listen to Tupac and you, you have all of that stuff cycling in your, in your system and then you brainwash yourself with all this violent music subconsciously. And so 
with all of that, it's easier for you to, you know, what I call flash off on people. You know, you get offended, you get emotional and you start living out the stuff that you've been brainwashing yourself on and the stuff that you've right. seen as a young man. And, you know, you know, not letting nobody punk you, you know, you can't let anybody talk, disrespect you. And, and that's kind of where it came from. It was less likely my dad. I mean, my dad was pretty, he was respectful, but my dad, you know, we get out of line, he'll tear you up, man. Like we got many whoopings and that was violent. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. Uh, so I think some of that kind of led to the, to the aggressiveness that I had, which made me good at football, you know? So but. no doubt. Yeah. If you can control and channel that anger and that aggression, it makes you, yeah, it makes you significantly better athlete. You have that competitive edge, you know, and I, yeah. and I, I've uh, trained jujitsu and other things with guys who, you know, have it and other guys who don't, some guys can turn it on and off. Some guys have no control of it whatsoever. Uh, yeah. That mentality certainly makes you good in one aspect of life, but it doesn't necessarily translate over in a healthy manner into other aspects of your life. True. It sounds like you uh, have have broken the the chain maybe a little bit or or, or deviated courses in a good way. D- do you feel like that? And and how do you feel about the direction that you've taken your life and now, of course, your family as well? Yeah, I feel like God separated me. You know, like uh, you know, I was I, I didn't want to leave Texas. I, you know, my whole family lives in Texas. I just was never going to leave Texas, no matter what happened. Never. I don't think I ever visited a place outside of Texas. I think we went to the Grand Canyon or something one time, but I, you know, I was never going to leave Texas. But I feel like God set me up to go to the University of Arizona so I can get away from the environment I was in, and learn something new and see the world from a different perspective. Like I grew up with just everything being about black people, you know, in an Afrocentric perspective, all my family's black. Every concern that I thought was realistic was just from, from the perspective of being black, you know, all the some of those concerns. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the police hate you. White people mm. hate you. Um, you got to work three times as hard as anybody else to be successful in life. You know, uh, you're never going to make it to the top. There ain't never going to be a black person in this position because white people always have this cloud over you. And, people follow you around in the store and they like, like all that's that. that's what you were being taught were, did you so did you experience that or was uh-huh. your experience different than what you were being conditioned to believe well some of it was so this is how i figured now that i'm grown and i see look back on it is that i created them thing, those things in my mind because that's what i believe was true so oh, if i see some white person look at me i'm like oh you just look at me because i'm black you know, I, I mean, I don't, I have no idea why they're looking at me. I got pulled over by our cops at least twice when I was in high school. And now when I look back as a police officer, they were actually incredibly nice. They didn't even give me a ticket. And the like, I would have done the same thing. Like, that was a real law, you know? And, 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 but when, at the time I was like, oh man, that cops is racist. You know, they put me over cause I'm black. They don't want to see a black man driving a, uh, I had a Mustang. I didn't want to see a black man driving a Mustang. And, and I'm like, when I was getting cop, I'm like, the cops make a pretty good money. Like a Mustang is not a significant car to a police officer. And if the guy wanted to be a jerk, he would have gave me a ticket. You know, sure, like right, he could have made right. me go to court and brought me. I, I had all kind of problems, but I never got a ticket even when I got pulled over. You know, so except me and my brother was weaving on a freeway one time. We were we were kind of like racing on the freeway and we got pulled over. And I think one of us got a ticket and it ended up getting thrown out. But, you know, so it, it was all created in my mind and it became my reality. I, did I have to work five times as hard as anybody else to be successful? No, that wasn't true. And when I got to college is when I realized like, dang, like white people really don't, they are not that concerned about black people. Like I thought they were like, hmm. there's not one person on campus that have ever been racist to me. My teachers love me. One reason, because I was an athlete, but, uh, but in, in general, I never had a problem with any of my teachers. I go to the TA or, or, you know, it was, it was never an issue. I had, I started to, develop white friends that were cooler than my black friends. It was like, man, I'm just, I think I've been living under in a, in a, in a real weird place. And it was when I got away from it and I got saved, I started seeing the world differently. I stopped looking at race when I got saved. I was like, you know, we're all God's children. You know, we, what is this race thing? Nobody cares. You know, only it's you're the good person or bad person. You know, good people don't care about it. Bad people do. And you know, at the end of the day, we gonna all have to answer to God. So, I mean, that that's kind of what really changed my trajectory. It's it's interesting that you're saying nobody cares because I've I've felt that way, and and it's not to say that I don't acknowledge that your skin, for example, is a little darker than mine. <laughs> like, obviously, yeah. you know, we can see that. Uh, but I've always thought, hey, this isn't a this isn't a big deal to me. This isn't something yeah. I I care deeply about, and yet. I've been told 
<laughs> by, you know, mainstream media and, and, and society that, well, that actually is also an indicator that <laughs> that you're racist. It's yeah. like everything is right. You know, whatever, whatever I do or don't do, like everything is is painted in this corner of, of being a racist. It's very, very interesting and frustrating, quite frankly. Right. Therefore, you could tell how disingenuous these conversations are because, you know, they have this plot of the boogeyman, the white racist boogeyman. That's it's not real because when you think about it, they say, OK, racism is real in America. Well, you, you hardly ever see real examples of racism. I mean, you could see one every now and again, some nut job. That's a complete nut. It's not a normal mm-hmm. person being racist, a nut job. And you see that and they go, oh, look at racism. And then you say, OK, there's not a lot of issues with race. We don't have a lot of examples. Oh, it's systemic. Yes. That, that means that we don't have to identify any one place. We just say it's in systems. Well, what system? The court system? Well, what judge? What what evidence do you have? So let's get rid of that judge. Oh, no, no, no. It's systemic. It's even beyond the judge. And the judge says, I'm not racist. I've never done anything racist. No, you don't. But you don't know it. You're racist, mm-hmm. but you don't know. It. It's subconscious. <laughs> it's implicit. Right. You're like, bro, it's a never ending lie. It's just it's just not true. And like most people in general don't care about race because it's so insignificant to everyday survival. Like a regular person is white in America you know, majority of the time, you probably don't even, most white people are probably not around black people like that because typically even in America, we still like, it's kind of segregated. Like, white Very segregated. Typically Agreed. live with white people. Black people typically live around black people. When I grew up around black people. I never saw white people like, except crackheads that you come in the community and buy drugs <laughs> uh, police officers. That's about it. That's the only white people that was in our community. So, you know, most people are like, they just want to go to work, man. They go to work. They're trying to feed their family. They're trying to figure out this life. Try, some people trying to find their way with God and, 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 most of the time is not a big issue. However, the manipulation in the mind through black people create this. So if a cop beat up a black man, it's not that the guy's a bad cop, it's that he's a racist. It's like, mm-hmm. no, the guy's a the guy's a bad cop. I mean, he'd be a white, right. white guy up that way. Um, you know, and 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 so it, it's 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 very weird. When I was a cop, I never saw a racist cop. I saw r- cops who were racially insensitive, you know, but I never saw a racist cop. I never saw anybody overtly racist or we just didn't have time. Like that's a, the most miserable life ever as a person to be a racist cop, because you got to go save the black people. <laughs> you know, When they call 911, my husband just beat me up. You can't just say, oh, no, I'm going to go into that one. Cause he's black. You right. know, you got to go and then if, if your husband is on his way back to the house with a gun, you can't say, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to intervene in that. Cause I don't like black people. You're going to have to put your life in danger over black people all day long, especially if you live in like the South South of Chicago, where it's majority white com- black community. You are literally risking your life and saving and dying for black people all day long. So the concept is just it's all manipulation to me. Now, there are some racist white people out here. There's racist. Of course, no doubt. There's, there's racist black. I, I would argue that there's more racist black people than racist white people. But um, there's an incredible amount of racist people on either side, man. Hispanic people hate black people. I mean, when I was growing up, black and Hispanic lived in a a similar community and we hate each other. Um, Mm. Black people hate white people. You know what I'm saying? Like when I was growing up and ain't nobody talks about this because they feel like black people can't be racist. When I was growing up, you know, my my grandmother and them used to hate white people, you know, and, and, you know, those same stereotypes when I was young, you can't, you can't date a white girl. You're a sellout. You're Uncle Tom. You sell out your race. Yeah, I was, I was wondering if you, you probably get that to, to this day. I, I bet more than you can oh, probably imagine, or I could anyways. I have never gotten a white person, personally. I mean, I, I think I think my wife may have got a comment from a white person, but I have never gotten a comment from a white person saying anything about me marrying a white woman. My wife is white. I, I get comments all day from black people that mm. I, I hate my people. I'm selling out. That's why I went and married that white woman. It's like... Racism in the black community is very prevalent. I mean, just look at BLM. That's a that's an organization of racist racism. But there are racist people in every aspect of life. It's not excluded to or, or ex, ex, you know, exclusive to any race. It's just it's just the spirit of evilness that's in people that cause them to lash out in in different forms. You've talked about your your path with God and Christ as as changing the trajectory of your life. Is is that the biggest factor? Why you why you are where you are? Like, what do you attribute to that? A hundred percent. It's it's that God changed me. That's that's what it was. My attitude, everything, it just changed the way I look at things, and I, and I and now I see. You know, God has a path for me. It's not just me out here, a lone wolf, just trying to figure it out. It's like, nah, man, be patient, keep working hard. You know, be a person with accountability, um, with integrity. And 
the tips are going to fall where God wants them to fall. And if they don't fall the way you want them to, just know that there's a plan and that there's something better. NFL, I, I'm glad I didn't make it to the NFL. People probably laugh at me. I'm glad I didn't make it to the NFL. I'm far more successful now than I would than I would have been if I made it to the NFL in a general sense, unless I was Tom Brady, which is, you know, even less of a percentage point because I was a defensive back and they come a dime a dozen. So, you know, I, I'm way more successful. I have way more influence. I'm, you know, financially, I'm I'm stable than most of my NFL friends. Mm-hmm. You know, they 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 still they trying to figure out their life. I'm I'm in my stride. You know, so and, and I've been able to influence people in a way that I, I would have never been able to influence people. And also my own perspective, you know, getting outside and uh, of that toxic situation I was in and, and growing up in a certain community to now being open to conservatism. And, 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 and ever since I realized what conservatism was and that I'm a conservative, I've been free ever since. I've been mm-hmm. free. I've been blessed. I make the most money I've ever made. I make the most friends. I, I, I feel like I'm a part of the American fabric. And I never felt like that until I, I pretty much realized that I like I'm a conservative. Like, dang, the conservatives think just like I think. All these people are very inspiring. We believe in capitalism. Make as much money as you can and help as many people as you can. Like, you know, I employ so many different people and I pay them very well. I give them bonuses. I love on them. You know, I care about their families and and that's what it's all about, man. It's not about the government. It's about individuals taking taking control. And I, I I will treat the people that work with me. I call I like to say they work with me. I'll treat them better than the government would ever treat them because the government is is nameless and it doesn't care about you. It's only you know after after set its own agenda. But as a person, I I, I love the people that that work with me and I support them and I you know I want to build an empire uh, with you know where I can support as many people as I can. That's powerful. Such a powerful perspective. You, you said uh, that God has a path for you or, or something along those lines. I don't want to put words in your mouth. Uh, if you were to be able to define or articulate what that path is or even what that path is moving forward, what would you say it is? Man, that's a, that's a good question. I think that God has put me in a position to be the voice of the people, you know, uh, the people that, that, that see things the way I see things and, and I'm their voice. And a voice of encouragement and a voice of authenticity, you know, somebody that like, you know, a lot of people are inspired. A lot of people have come to me and said that they want to commit suicide, but I gave them hope. Uh, you know, a lot of people that happen to be white are saying, man, I was ready to give up. And I thought the world was just coming to an end. And I felt so pressured and, you know, so beat down from being white. But you gave me hope that there's that not everybody feels that way and that there's another side to this thing. And and so but also. God has called me to witness and be try to be an example of what Jesus was. And that's through being successful and also being a servant to the people. And so with all the success that I've been able to get, I mean, we've given away, I've given away almost a half a million dollars uh, to people. And then when you add Blexit, we've given away over a million dollars to people in the last year. So, um, you know, it's, it's, that's what, that's what God wants me to be is the uh, light and be a reflection of Christ and be able to speak up for the people and be the voice and also be, you know, an example of you can be a Christian and be successful. I mean, you can be a Christian and have a fun life um, and you can influence the world and, and, and you can be uh, reassured that God has a plan and you can follow that plan and that plan will lead to happiness and not necessarily disappointment. Well, from one, one man's perspective, you're doing a phenomenal job. That's why I want to have this conversation with you. You know, I, I know you've got a book coming up in the fall. And uh, we, I'd be honored to have you back on as if you, if you want to talk about it, I'd be honored to have you back here. But uh, why don't you tell me a little bit about the book and the premise and that way guys know where to turn when it comes out in, I think, November. Is that right? Yeah, November the 30th. And, and I'll be, it'd be an honor for me to come back. And I, th- I think you've done an incredible job. You know, some people can't interview, you know, they just, they don't know how to talk. They don't know how to lead questions. And I think you've done a tremendous job. Thank you. you know, next time I'll have my, uh, my uh, camera set properly because I could I, I feel like it's lagging a little bit. However, the book uh, "Beating Black and Blue" was just a dream of mine. I had a dream when I was like I said, a dream. I had a vision that when I was you know when I was a police officer with no influence, going check to check, you know, barely making. I had to work off duty and overtime just to make my bills. <laughs> you know, so you know, and I, I never thought that I the book would be you know. I just it was a thought. It was a vision in my mind that I was going to write a book called "Beating Black and Blue." And then the other book, you know, I won't name it because I don't want anybody stealing my idea, but it was two books. And, you know, lo and behold, you know, the opportunity presented itself. And, you know, I wrote the book called Beating Black and Blue. And it's a book that's 
you know, it, it, it encompasses a lot of different things. You know, I talk about a little bit about my upbringing, how I became a police officer, you know, racism and, and, and prejudice on the police department and police brutality and, and um, you know, a defund the police. We even mm. talk about George Floyd, that that uh, whole entire case. We talk about other cases of police brutality that were where cops were right, but the public say that they're wrong. And then we have some where the cops were wrong. And the public say they wrong, you know, <laughs> so <laughs> right, right. I'll put that in there. And then I interviewed five officers, one being Sean Payne, which is the officer that, that really is the reason I became a police officer, interviewed them about, you know, what is it like being a police police officer in this environment? And then what are the solutions? You know, mm. what are the solutions to the problems? And, and and I finished the book giving solutions, not only from those police officers that give their take on it, but then uh, people get an opportunity to hear my perspective on what I think is the winning solution to kind of curb and fix these things. I think the book gives the police officers a voice and it gives the public a, a little bit of insight on on kind of what we go through. I think both are valuable. I had notes to talk about that, but just for the sake of time, we'll maybe we'll save that for part two when the book comes out. We're going to sync everything up so the guys know where to turn. But man, I appreciate you and I appreciate your work. I'm actually really looking forward to the next time we do this because there are other conversations that need to be had. And uh, I'm honored to be able to have this conversation with you, brother. Thanks for joining me. Well, it's my pleasure. And, and I love to have continue this conversation. Um, there's a lot of things that men... Uh, need to talk about. And, and I think a lot of people may not, it may not be intentional, but they don't touch on these things and it's a touchy subject and people don't want to hurt people's feelings and they don't want to be sound sexist and, and right. you know, all right. this other stuff. And it's like, nah, we need to have these conversations. We need real men to have conversations about certain things that men go through, certain things that women go through. Uh, because in my perspective, we are the leaders of the nation. You know, I think that you know, everybody's equal in general, generally speaking, their worth is equal. However, the position is different. Men need to lead. And according to the Bible, the man is the head of the household. And the reason why our country is falling apart is because men does not take their position. You know, it's not up to women to do it. And although women are taking the lead and, 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 and to me, it's a shame that men cannot lead. You know, women have to take up the slack. Women have to take care of the kids. Women have to, to go out and be CEOs and work and be mama. You know, it, it, People can do what they want to do. It's America. However, I think men need to take the responsibility and start stepping up and being solid men with integrity, leading and, and raising families. And even if you don't have a family, be a man that a woman can marry for the sake of for, for God's sake. All these trashy men out here. There's a lot of good women that don't have nobody to marry because they still playing video games and want to. And I'm not saying anything wrong playing video games, but I'm saying if you don't have a, a bank account, you don't have good credit, you don't you don't have a job. You probably shouldn't be playing video games all day. But we have men that are just, you know, caught up in this environment and they're not taking their position in society. And we watch our society crumble on the on the shoulders of emotionalism. And men need to take a strong stance with, with a logical perspective and lead. And, and if and if we do that in our nation. I really do think we can see a, a, a really uh, remarkable recovery, but men have to take their responsibility um, of the failure of success in this country. What better way to just put a stamp on our conversation, man? That's powerful stuff. Very powerful. I'm very much in alignment with that. All right, brother, I'll let you get going. I know you got a busy schedule, but I appreciate you and your time and your insight. The guys are really going to enjoy what we've been talking about today. Thanks, man. Thank you, Ryan. I appreciate it, man.